This game is rated 17 plus for a reason. Please do not continue if you are not of the appropriate age demographic. The survival horror genre was always one that piqued my curiosity, but it wasn't until I was a bit older that horror games made their way to my attention. I want to say I was about 12 or 13 years old when my brother first got Resident Evil for the Nintendo GameCube. I didn't play it for myself, I just watched, but I was enamored by the looming sense of dread that accumulated in my stomach. It's not a pleasant feeling, but I definitely wanted more. I wanted to experience more horror games, so instead of playing horror games myself, I would watch other people play them, whether it be online or in person, I wouldn't dare actually play them because I was, and still am frankly, a cowardly chicken shit. My brother got Resident Evil 7, an amazing game no doubt, and I played through the majority of it on our now defunct Let's Play channel, Hearts of Gaming, good luck finding it. That was my first time playing more than 30 seconds of a horror game, and I dreaded it. But I was still addicted to the sense of fear that it instilled in me. I continued to search for horror games, Resident Evil, who is my favorite, Dead Space, Alien Isolation, Illblade. This eventually led me to the Silent Hill series, often regarded as one of the best horror games of all time. At least, it was considered that in the 2000s. I, admittedly, don't have too much history with the Silent Hill series. I am so excited for the Silent Hill 2 remake, but when it comes to the originals, my experience is pretty hands off, watching others play or review it. The original Silent Hill for the PlayStation is a fantastic game. I got pretty far, I want to say over halfway through, but not only did I get stuck, but my nerves got the best of me. The original Silent Hill 2 I played a chunk of, a couple hours, I skipped 3 entirely, I wasn't very interested, and I moved to 4 because I loved the concept of Silent Hill 4. I put 30 minutes into it, and then proceeded to never play it again, and I slept with the lights on that night because Silent Hill 4 is the scariest game I've ever played in my life, bar none. Silent Hill 4 has such a unique and creative way of getting in your head that it makes you scared of your own house, but this video isn't about that. A year ago, Silent Hill 2 Remake was announced for the PS5 and PC. There was a large bit of stupid online drama too. People didn't like how the gameplay looked, or how the updated faces looked, but with a great new trailer and the critic reviews a few days before release, it certainly bounced back. Good job, Bloober team. I'm incredibly excited for this game. Let's look at Silent Hill 2. Our story kicks off with James Sunderland in a public bathroom showing off the impressive realistic graphics by squeezing his hand and touching his face. A common way of revealing whether you are lucid dreaming or not. James has come to the town of Silent Hill after receiving a letter from his late wife, Mary. The letter states that she is waiting for James in Silent Hill, a pleasant resort town that they used to visit and considered to be their special place. However, according to James, it's been three years since Mary's passing, and this town is certainly no pleasant resort. Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. It's covered in a very thick and spooky scary fog, and is inhabited by lots of disturbing creatures. So in typical fashion for this genre, his desire to delusionally believe in something that is undoubtedly impossible subjects him to horrors beyond his comprehension. As James, you will wander all about Silent Hill in search of Mary, through an apartment building, a hospital, a prison, and ending off at a waterfront hotel. Controlling James is typical for the genre. Movement is very similar to that of the recent Resident Evil remakes. In a third person, perspective, you explore labyrinthian dungeons to solve cryptic riddles and puzzles, find items, and defend yourself against these hideous creatures. This being a game in the survival horror genre, there's a surplus of enemies to manage with only a limited amount of ammunition and healing items to go around. Something worth mentioning is that this game has two separate difficulty settings, one for combat and one for puzzles, which I think is a fantastic idea that more games should offer. The puzzles did stump me on occasion. Specifically this noose one in the yard. When I was in the apartments and I saw this clock missing all of its hands and this cryptic ass poems on the table next to it, I thought to myself, this is a Silent Hill game alright. I can't sing the same praises for this game's combat unfortunately. The first weapon you get in this game is a wooden plank. You'll never have to worry about it breaking or having limited use, which I don't think needs to be a thing here, but some sense of urgency is definitely lost when your stick or later on your metal pipe can always be used with no consequence 
consequence other than having to get a little more hands-on with your foe. I played on easy mode for the combat because 1. I'm a coward, and 2. Because I'm exceptionally bad at shooting games. But even I, with these disadvantages in mind, felt that the game was overly generous with ammunition and health item handouts. I had over 80 rounds of handgun ammo at one point. But this game is a masterclass in creating an unsettling atmosphere, with disgusting creatures swiftly moving beneath vehicles in this frankly gorgeous and intensely thick fog. It was enough to make me regret deciding to make a video about this game. Cramped corridors with enemies that always make their presence known to ramp up the adrenaline, all without relying on jump scares. This game does not utilize jump scares, which I am very grateful for. I think everyone knows how cheap they are, and aside from the wind blowing these doors open, there are no examples of jump scares in this game, other than if you missed an enemy and it snuck up behind you, but that's kind of self-inflicted, isn't it? The main unique game mechanic of the Silent Hill series is the radio. Whenever a monster is nearby, your radio will emit static, getting more intense the closer you are to said monster. This is an amazing way of ramping up tension. Even if you can't see it, you know that a monster is somewhere close. You can even hear the static through the controller's speaker, which is a nice touch. The enemies themselves, like I said earlier, are disgusting. There is, in my opinion, not enough variety, as you see the same handful of enemies throughout the whole game. But what's here is very good. There are these lion creatures, a torso on legs, with feet shaped as what seems to be some type of platform heels, and a zipper on the back. Since it has no arms, I'm assuming it's implied to be a straitjacket. The mannequin is two pairs of legs attached on top of one another, often hiding or disguising itself into the furnish. The nurse, a stereotypically sexualized archetype of a hospital nurse, with a grotesque bubble of fluid as a head. Mandarins you don't see all too often. They're mostly used as enemies out of reach to make encounters more intense. The hall monitor enemy. Lastly, and most infamously, is Pyramid Head. This executioner with a giant blade and heavy looking helmet. But where do they come from? Why are they here, and why do they look the way they do? Well, to answer that, we're gonna have to get into more lore here. Silent Hill is a town that draws people in to deal with their psychological problems. Everyone here has something wrong with them. James is here due to a letter from his dead wife, you'll come across a mischievous little girl named Laura, and finally you'll meet Eddie and Angela. You get the sense that there's just something not right with these two. They're seemingly nonsensical and awkward rants, while adding to the unsettling atmosphere of the game, also gives you the idea that they're not exactly playing with a full deck. Each of these characters are here for their own reason. Angela is looking for her lost mother in various scenes throughout the game, imply that she was sexually abused by her father, and is contemplating suicide. Eddie has murderous tendencies, was constantly ridiculed and shamed for his weight, and in the end, James ends up killing him. The voice acting is fantastic. I love James' voice. I love James' portrayal overall. He's a very stoic and silent person, very relatable. But across the board, James, Mary, Eddie, all very well done with just the right amount of awkwardness to add to the otherworldly feeling that this game provides. They even kept this amazing line from the original. This town's full of monsters. Who could just sit here and eat pizza? This town is full of monsters. Mm. How can you sit there and eat pizza? This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there eating pizza? Ow! As I was saying, everyone's problems cause them to see Silent Hill a little differently. James, due to his dead wife, sees a lot of monsters that most likely represent his pent-up frustration regarding his intimate life. His monsters being amalgamations of sexualized cliches, legs, heels, nurse outfits. But Pyramid Head is an interesting one. Pyramid Head is pretty much James. It's a representation of his guilt that James feels due to his wife's passing. Eddie and Angela both see their own inner demons, I guess you could call them, and Laura, being so fearless and nonchalant, is implied to see Silent Hill as a normal town due to being a young and innocent child. I love this idea for a horror series. A town that draws people with intense problems inside and subjects them to gross representations of their inner demons. It's very creative and, in my opinion, much more meaningful than simply zombies or ghosts or whatever. Dealing with enemies is admittedly more comfortable than it should be. I know I was playing on easy combat mode, but with a handgun, shotgun, and later on a rifle, I became pretty desensitized to the fear that these guys are supposed to bring to the table, which I am aware 
where it's par for the course of a horror game, but after the apartments, I didn't feel threatened by much. I do plan on playing through the game again though, so I'll definitely play on a harder difficulty next time. The sense of fear in the latter half of the game more so came from the looming atmosphere. It bears repeating how amazing of a job they did recreating this town to fit modern standards. The fog is wonderful. The abandoned buildings with their creaks and distant noises are eerie, and notes left behind by folks living here at some point are great for adding detail to the world around you. When you're through exploring a dungeon, you'll typically end up in the other world, essentially a parallel dimension of Silent Hill where everything is rusted and falling apart at the seams, and more enemies, much more aggressive enemies at that. You don't usually spend too long here. The other world versions of dungeons are typically the final stretch where you're on your way out, so don't freak out and think that you have a whole nother dungeon ahead of you. But this place is scary, and believe it or not, it'll actually make you miss the foggy atmosphere of the normal Silent Hill. When James escapes the apartment building, he comes across a woman named Maria. Maria is a carbon copy of James' wife, but dressed in a more seductive outfit and different hair. It may be obvious at this point, but Maria is conjured up by Silent Hill to represent what James sees in his wife. Maria accompanies you through a large chunk of the game, including following Laura into the Brookhaven Hospital after she mentions Mary by name. Besides startling me when I mistake her for an enemy, she really doesn't do much aside from being a tool used to obtain different endings. Yes, this game has multiple endings, it is a survival horror game after all. Maria will die multiple times, most notably when she is stabbed by Pyramid Head. Uh, both times, that happens twice. But she just keeps coming back. The hospital is also where you have your first boss fight. Well, actual boss fight. There's a pyramid head encounter at the apartments. Bosses were always something that I considered to be a lackluster in the survival horror genre. They've garnered a reputation, at least to me, of being run to the side of the room, shoot a couple rounds, run to the other side as you reload, rinse and repeat until it falls. And for the most part, that is the case here. This boss in the hospital, the double pyramid heads, the final boss, these all fall into this category. I will say that the boss against Angela's dad in the labyrinth is more of a chase and it's very intense and the boss fight against Eddie is definitely the best boss fight in the game. It takes place in this giant butcher freezer, in the dark with leaking pipes spraying mists that even further obstruct your view. The key to winning is listening closely to any scurrying or talking in the distance and then following it. This, along with the radio, really shows how well audio can contribute to a scary atmosphere. The only time you're able to see in here is when Eddie fires off a round which illuminates light for a split second. Very cool boss. Eddie's boss fight takes place after you complete the Toluca Prison, which ended up being my favorite dungeon in the game. With weights that you find throughout the building, you'll weigh down a scale to have an arrow point to different animals, which unlocks the correspondingly labeled door. Not to mention this long ass staircase. This is something you'd backwards long jump in Mario 64. After killing Eddie, the final dungeon at the Lakeview Hotel awaits you. After multiple dungeons of creepy and dimly lit buildings, I greatly appreciated exploring this luxury hotel. When Mary was alive, there was a room that they would always stay in, and your goal is to find a way up there with all these monsters about. The most contrived puzzles also take place here. I found the puzzles in this game to be very creative, but this one with the princess statues? Maybe I'm slow, but it took me way longer than it should have. Also, this next point isn't necessarily the game's fault, but I was playing through The Last of Us while simultaneously playing through this game. In The Last of Us, the interact button is triangle. You press triangle to do pretty much everything in that game. Here though, triangle is the button to use your very valuable healing items. If there was an option to customize the button layout, I didn't see it. Especially under all these accessibility options. The accessibility options in this game are almost overwhelming. You can highlight NPCs for the visually impaired, change the text font to this alien hominid Newgrounds ass text, change the size of the text, you have colored subtitles, name of the character speaking, make button prompts display the button you need to press, as well as show when things are able to be interacted with, which I definitely turned on because I'm terrible at games like this. You can change the opacity, thickness, visibility, and color of your shooting reticle, or even turn it off altogether. Am I playing a Naughty Dog game or something? This isn't a bad thing, this stuff is 
is great, it's just a lot more than I expected. As I was saying, when James finally makes it up to his shared hotel room, he watches a VHS tape that reveals a huge plot twist that, despite being part of a 23 year old story, I am not going to reveal. After completing this and following through to the final boss, you'll get one of three endings. The most common ending for first time players is the leave ending. As said in the title, James and Laura just leave Silent Hill. It may seem anticlimactic, but with the plot twist and the heartbreaking letter that James reads, it definitely works. There's an ending where James decides to stick with Maria and leave town with her, and there's an ending where James, after being revealed of the plot twist, decides to take his own life and drive his car into a body of water. What determines your ending is very strange for a video game. It's a combination of how often you looked at the letter and photo of Mary in your inventory, how much time you spend with Maria, how much time you spend at critically low health, things like that. I could imagine that it makes shooting for a specific ending more convoluted than it needs to be. But I admire the idea. Once you beat the game, you unlock New Game Plus, which allows you to find new items, try new graphics modes, but most importantly, it lets you get new endings. There are three new endings unique to the remake, along with two joke endings returning from the original. This ending has James get abducted by a UFO, and there's one of James finding a dog acting as a mastermind, controlling everything like a puppet master. On that note, let's talk about the music. You'd think that not much emphasis would be on the music as this is a horror game, and you're mostly right. The majority of the time there is just atmospheric droning eeriness or sound effects present to make you scared. But when there is music, primarily during cutscenes or the credits, it is amazing. Angela's theme when you find her in the apartments, and oh my god, Laura's theme, it's wonderful. I actually have been listening to it outside of playing the game. Go listen to the soundtrack. Even when it has an electric guitar, it still somehow manages to be fitting. Graphics are... well, they're very good. Very good, in fact. I've mentioned this a few times already with James's hand in the fog. It's a very pretty looking game. Even details such as the dirt under James's nails goes a long way. Close-ups on his face show insane detail. The lighting is very well done, though I can't stand how video game flashlights only project like five feet in front of you. A gripe with with the genre in general, not specifically this game. Even with the game running at 60 frames per second, cutscenes are locked to 30. And even then it feels like it struggles to reach even that. I'm assuming the game is loading environments while these are playing, which could explain this. So in the end, how was this game overall? I loved it. It was brilliant. The tone, the visuals, the updates to just about everything, it's exactly how I wanted it. And I'm so happy that I finally finished a horror game. Silent Hill seems to be making a comeback, as there are two more games planned in the future. And unlike this one, those are planned to be true new entries to the franchise, which makes me incredibly excited. Bloober Team pulled through and delivered a great game here, though I'm sure the original game still has merit. When remaking a game like this, you're not just competing with the original, you're competing against years and years of attachment, connection, and discourse. Usually when a game gets remade to this caliber, I still feel like the original is worth playing alongside it, and I'm sure that this is no exception. Okay, bye.